Virginian potato. I distinguish the Virginian potato from the sweet potato. That tuber, when it first arrives on these shores, is considered literally outlandish. You know, what do we do with this thing? How do we accommodate it in our diets? How do we grow it? How do we harvest it? How do we cook it? Now, these are questions that not just food historians, but sociologists of food, social anthropologists have been interested in, not just for the 16th and 17th centuries, but, you know, how do we deal with acquiring new tastes? What system? 
systems, what frameworks do we put them in? And sociologists like Paul Fieldhouse have argued that what we need is a sort of framework of familiar novelty. We fit them in by accommodating them within systems that are already familiar. We'll so, can we cook them in recipes we know? Can we use equipment in our kitchens that we already have to cook them? So on and so forth. So this idea of familiar novelty, fitting them in before we even get to individual taste preferences. So think about social, economic, psychosocial, and even religious frameworks. Why am I telling you all of this while this bizarre recipe sits on the screen? Because the potato, the tuber bit of the potato, was accommodated in those ways. Potatoes were serendipitously very well suited to being grown in British soils. The climate suited them, particularly in areas like the northwest of England and without uh, foreshadowing the tragedy of the uh, Irish famine in places like Ireland where other essential grains actually flourish less well. So the potato tuber was quickly adopted and we see in recipe books and recipe collections, yes they did exist in the 17th and 18th century, people did write about food, um, we see potatoes being uh, accommodated by being treated as if they were other roots, like carrots and skirrets and parsnips, things that were already familiar, potatoes were cooked in that way. So far, so familiar. Which brings me to this recipe. Okay, now I know it's quite small, so I might read it out to you. Um, this is the sort of stuff that makes me go, Woo! in the archives, okay? <laughs> Because, you know, you can read lots of recipes and say, yeah, another recipe for wafers, another recipe for apple, blah, blah, blah. Then you come across something like this. So it reads, to pickle potatoes. Take your young potato apples when they are to be got, hewed in August, when they are the bigness of large nutmegs. Take them and put them in a large brass pot with some fair water. One ounce of rock alum, potassium and aluminium sulfate, for you people, stifle them for an hour and a half, and if they do not look very green, stifle them a little longer. The language of these recipes is fabulous. <laughs> when they are green, take them off and put them one by one to cool. Then make a pickle with vinegar, as much as will cover them with salad, by which they probably mean salad burn the herb. Cloves, mace, and whole pepper and salt them much will give them a good relish, let it boil very well, take it off, blah 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 blah. blah. Pour off your pickle, put a nub of two of rock alum again in the pot and lay them down close and keep them in a cold cellar for your use. This is from a recipe collection, a handwritten recipe collection from the 1670s uh, attributed to one Joan Yates. And I know the question you're all dying to ask here is one, what is a battalion? And two, why did this make me go ah! in the archives? Well, <laughs> I had to uh, dig, literally and figuratively, long and hard to find out what a patalian was. There is no entry for patalian in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, but potato apples, there is. And potato apples are the fruit above ground of the potato. And there are some gardeners and allotmenteers amongst you who are, who are nodding and thinking, I wouldn't want to pickle them within an inch of my life. <laughs> Potato apples are indeed poisonous. They contain concentrations of glycoalkaloids, particularly but not exclusively solanine, uh, which makes them toxic in various degrees, depending on the variety of potato, and also um, likely to make you vomit, have very upset stomach, diarrhea, and possibly, in extreme concentrations, die. So why, in 1673 or thereabouts, was Joan Yates writing a recipe for pickling the damn things, as if to eat with a salad? And why, a few years earlier, is Robert Boyle, Robert Boyle, here is my you know, uh, scientist for the evening, writing to a friend in 1663 saying exactly the same thing. The branch will bring forth fruit which we call the potato 
two apple, and they are very good to pickle for a winter salad. Now, before you go and think, oh, they didn't eat salads in the 17th century. Yes, they did. And local resident over in Deptford, John Evelyn, wrote a very good book about salads at this very time. They were deeply fashionable called Acetaria. And if you really want a nice salad dressing, his salad dressing in Acetaria is excellent. That I will recommend. Jerry Atia, recipe for pickling Italians? No. However, her recipe tells us quite a few things about the modes of familiarising and experimenting with new foodstuffs. Robert Boyle, as some of you will probably know, was a founding father of the Royal Society and at the centre of a network of correspondents, all excited about the possibilities of these these new goods, these new commodities, these new edibles, and experimenting with what came into their kitchens and their laboratories. So what we think we can see here is Joan Yates participating in that experimentalism. Although whether she survived is another matter. Because even though this is a method that might, and I, I look here to Ben's and Lorenzo because this may be something we could try <laughs> and just test <laughs> to see whether the pickling process actually might go some way to neutralizing some of the glycoalkaloids in the potato apples. Some of you may know that wild potatoes in South America, which do contain high concentrations of these glycoalkaloids in, in the wild, um, can be cooked in edible clay substances to neutralize some of those glycoalkaloids. So is, is the pickling process doing some of that here? We don't know because nobody's tried it as far as I know. The other thing to mention here is that there is a sense in the late 17th century that some of these new foodstuffs may be really good for the body medicinally. We know that tea and coffee and chocolate didn't come in as beverages for pleasure. They came in as medicinal, new medicinal compounds, the wonder foods, the nutraceuticals of the 17th century. <laughs> is the is the is the pickle battalion doing the same? Are they, are they trying to do the same thing with this uh, part of the plant, the potato plant, that they don't know what to do with? Indigenous, there were no indigenous uh, frameworks. The you know South Americans did not pickle their battalions. Okay. <laughs> The reason why they're probably more likely to have grown in Britain is because of the climatic conditions. They do appear more often when the summers are cool and wet. So the conditions may have uh, made the potatoes more likely to produce fruit in Britain than in the South American original conditions. So, obviously, the first thing to say to you is do not try this at home. Okay? If your potato plants produce potatoes, don't follow that recipe. Because the um, most researchers agree that despite the fact that the uh, toxic, toxic, toxicity might vary across the different um, uh, varieties of potato, it's still unlikely to be very good for you. Um, Usually, I uh, end my talks with um, a handout of recipes, historic recipes that you can take away. But I feel that, as in um, the legendary Horrible Histories uh, segment, um, Joan Yate was probably going to die a very stupid death if she did this, <laughs> uh, ate this regularly. And I think, from my point of view as a recipe scholar, it's interesting to note that this is the only example of this recipe I have ever found. And I've looked at hundreds of manuscript recipe books. Recipes were currency in the 17th and 18th century. They circulated amongst friends and around communities. The fact that this recipe doesn't seem to have gone anywhere else <laughs> is suggestive <laughs> that it wasn't. <coughs> Either Joan Yate didn't try it herself. I don't know what happened to Joan. I found no record of her. Um, but also, 
the fact that it's not even uh, annotated in any way in her manuscript suggests that, unlike others where new goods are crossed through and said, you know, Jamaica pepper, some people use it, but we don't like it, or this recipe is good for nothing. You know, people did that in their manuscript recipes. There's nothing about the journey. So, please don't try this at home. By all means, try other historical recipes that you feel confident that you know the ingredients, what they're about, what they do, but this one, uh-uh. Thank you. <laughs>